Hey everyone, in my latest podcast, I learn if you take one compound, it affects one portion of the brain. However, this private company is now focusing on a drug that has multiple compounds in it that could have a positive effect on multiple portions of the brain. Where was the idea created? Their years of experience working with Big Pharma. And they also share how Big Pharma has done little to nothing to improve mental health for almost 50 years. You're going to want to hear this in our latest podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Dales Report. And before we get into today's obviously podcast, as usual, if you like what we're obviously producing, make sure to subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. And as usual, we want to talk about the psychedelic space. And right now, this industry from a capital markets perspective has struggled to say the least over the last year. But on the private side, it's making huge steps forward. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to find out today. We bring in two very sophisticated people. Happy to be joined with the CEO of Tessellate, Dr. Rochelle Hines, along with the chairman and chi uh, chief scientific officer, Dr. Dustin Hines. Uh, great to see you uh, both, Dr. Hines. Is Rochelle, great to see you. How are things? Excellent. We're doing fantastic. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you know, it's great to obviously have you on. Dr. Uh, Hines as well. Great to see you as well. Uh, so you're both living in las vegas uh let's get started because obviously my viewers want to know a little bit about you know who you are and what you're doing so the company name is tessellate rochelle and you're a pre-public company in the mental health industry working to develop drugs for the future of mental health therapeutics from a lab located as i mentioned at the university of nevada las vegas unlv go run and rebels uh being a newcomer can you explain to my viewers what Tessellate's mission statement is and what it hopes to accomplish, uh, accomplish Excuse me, obviously, in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So the name was chosen because we tend to think about the way that things fit together. So a tessellation is like you would see in a tile mosaic, and the pieces fit perfectly together. And we think about our team in that way. So myself and Dustin, we have complementary skill sets, and we have different sort of talents and assets that we bring to the team. And also our other team members were selected for the way that they fit in with us. And it's also the way that we think about the brain. So many mental health disorders are not just a single neurotransmitter system or right. failure in, this, in a specific receptor. There are multiple things that are fitting in together and we need to address that in order to more effectively treat these disorders. So what was the initiative? Why did you get involved in this, You know, uh, bringing this whole business together? Um, you know, really. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, sorry, uh, maybe I should bring up somebody's name first, but my apologies. But yeah, go ahead. Do you mind if I call you Dustin or Dr. Dr. Hines? What's best? Please, Dustin. Dustin, okay. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah I think both Michelle and I have kind of been at this intersection between industry and academia our whole careers. And really, working in the past with big pharma, we saw that there really has been no innovation since the 60s to the 70s. Most of the drugs that came wow. out of maybe in the 50s and 60s. The newer versions of those drugs have less toxicity or less harmful, but they're basically the same molecule. So we really were in this period uh, working at Tufts with AstraZeneca through IMED, where Pharma had said, we're out, right? This is really hard for us to do. We need to partner in a different way. And they found partnerships through small businesses right. and through academia. So we really tried to make that model work with our small business and have been met with open arms with UNLV, who's a separate entity from our business. So really an, uh, the ability to take a business and combine it with academia is a huge strength where you have the basic science, uh, science and the knowledge. You know, you bring up a valid point because this is a conversation I've had a lot over the last few months learning more about this industry is about how the progression in research when it comes to mental health has been pretty stale for 40 or 50 years. And you just said it. So with the background, can you actually take us behind the scenes? And we've understood or at least the perception is that this has been all about generating money for big pharma for quite some time. Um, this has always been there as far as mental health challenges, but why is it so much different today versus say even 10, 15 years ago? And either one of you can answer that question. I think Rochelle's probably best to answer this. Oh. this <laughs> okay. Um, so I think, you know, it's really, we, we really thought we kind of hit the nail on the head with the serotonin hypothesis of, say, major depressive disorder, for example. Right. And then we were sort of, you know, really focused in on that. And 
and I think it's been, you know, more recent that we started to appreciate that, you know, depression is a complex disorder. It's heterogeneous, and even people with the same diagnosis um, can have a lot of different factors rolling into that. And mm-hmm. then there's also really been kind of a few other theories of, of depression and mental health that are, are kind of catching steam. And at the same time, we're starting to realize that there are a number of issues with the serotonin hypothesis. In the very least, it's, a, it's quite an incomplete picture. And so, you know, it, it's sort of now kind of letting go of that hypothesis that maybe wasn't taking us in the right direction and, and refocusing on, um, you know, other alternative pathways and complementary pathways that might be necessary in order to treat disorders of the brain. And not, not to keep coming back to what's in a name, but what's in a name with Tesla, that really is at the heart of it. You know, big pharma and a lot of these industries have focused on a single neurotransmitter, like Rizal said earlier, and then a single compound. What we're really trying to do is get psychedelics and modulators to work right. together. Because what we're talking about mental health are things like mood. And, and mood is a nebulous word. And it's complicated. It's unlikely to involve a single neurotransmitter or a single synapse or a single area of your brain. So what we're really trying to do is to put these compounds and chemicals together in a in a more I don't want to say sophisticated, but a more educated, modern way. Where that's we're interesting. At so how would that work? And then? let me correct myself on that too. It's not more sophisticated because a lot of what we're doing comes from shamans. So shamans in the day would never just mix psychedelics. They would, for instance, take tobacco, russicana, and mix it with some psychedelics because they understood there was multiple systems that needed to right. be affected at things. So you're talking about actually bringing these together and actually targeting different uh, neurons within the brain versus like one specific compound targeting one specific. That's interesting. So is there any, um, I guess, have you had any concerns about some of the, like, if, if it's not successful, what are some of the ramifications? Like, how do you best answer that? We keep doing this. I can start off. I, I think that, uh, again, from our pharma background uh, and working in the brain, the biggest issue with why compounds fail um, that work in the brain is because they also work in the heart. So they have side effects in the heart. Um, and we do have concerns. We think there's lots of great psychedelic compounds out there, but we do know some psychedelic compounds already are affecting the heart negatively. So our first worry would be something called toxicology. Yeah. And uh, maybe you can maybe uh, speak to the sub sub type of serotonin receptors because I think that's a great segue for that. Yeah, absolutely. So most psychedelics target serotonin receptors, and a number of psychedelics hit a number of these targets. And so serotonin receptors are um, the site that receives the chemical signal um, that's, again, broadly implicated in words like mood and arousal yeah. Um, yeah. and, you know, just how, how we feel overall. Um, but there's many different types of receptors that serotonin can bind to. And one that seems really common and really important among all of the psychedelic drugs is known as the 5-HT2A receptor. Yes. And that seems really important for how the brain responds to psychedelics. But then there are other receptors for serotonin, like the 5-HT2B receptor. So very similar in structure, a part of the same family. But this one is enriched in the heart. And other drugs in the past, like fenfluramine, for example, um, was actually pulled from the market because of the effects that it had on 5-HT2B receptors. And we learned, you know, unfortunately, maybe a little bit too late, that it was having deleterious effects because it was binding to and activating these receptors in the heart. And so the That's heart is, you know, in a way like a like a simple brain. And, and it well, has a in lot a lot of, of ways, I've never really had this portion of the conversation because a lot of it is mental health, but something that actually hasn't been brought up or talked about a lot is the effect on a heart. But that, you know, how much is that, I guess, maybe Dustin not talked about within the industry? And when it comes from research medical side, uh, how much of a concern is that right now with the current landscape within the industry? Yeah, so one of the things we're seeing that, you know, our company and kind of who Raquel and I are, uh, we want to ameliorate is some of the tribalism. So there's huge tribalism now between, you know, plant people and big pharma yeah. and everyone in the middle. So I think that some of the plant products have, I don't want to call it an entourage effect, but a series of compounds that are amazing that we don't understand that we should explore more. But 
they also have some off-target effects like we're talking about here relating to the heart. In big pharma, they're only worried about a single target. And at some level, they might miss the beautiful effects from those entourage effects, but they might mitigate some of those negative effects. So we kind of find ourselves in the middle. <laughs> we find one camp, that's all they talk about is the side effects, and the other camp really doesn't talk about those effects mm -hmm. at all, which have been well known for 20, 30 years, uh, very extensively studied the valvular dysfunction in the heart from things such as psilocybin. So when, Rochelle, when I look at your current clinical pipeline, you're currently preparing to initiate a phase one clinical trial on your two current lead candidates, which is TSL8108, uh, otherwise known as PEA, and the modulator TSL8303, while also advancing preclinical validation of intellectual property. So based off that, if proven successful, uh, what kind of mass commercial appeal does that uh, result in pertaining to the research that you're going to be doing? Yeah, so to talk about um, the 100 series compound first. So that is um, a psychedelic. It's part of a broader family of psychedelics called phenethylamines. And yes. it's a novel chemical entity. So this is a, a new to the world psychedelic that we've um, innovated on. And we got interested in this class of molecules called phenethylamines because they have high potency and high selectivity for that 5-HT2A receptor that um, seems to be core to the psychedelics. And so, um, you know, we're really excited about that one. Um, it's, you know, a, a best-in-class psychedelic molecule. So we're, we're quite excited to move, move that candidate forward. And then the other one that you mentioned is um, what we call a modulator. Right. And Tessalate, again, is really working on advancing this idea that it might not just be 5-HT2A. There might need to be some other components added in there. And so we also have a modulator lead. And the modulator lead is meant to be added to um, a psychedelic compound. And this is where it gets really interesting for us is because we've also been able to take a look at some of these modulators and how they might apply to other psychedelics, you know, that people may be interested in in advancing. So it's not only that these modulators were, will work with our compounds, but they're also um, applicable to any other um, psychedelic experience. And so we really think that this is going to be a game changer for bringing psychedelics um, into the forefront clinically. You know, they're going to provide ways to manage the psychedelic experience uh, for patients and provide okay. more predictability and more um, sort of safety or mitigate some of the risks associated with maybe somebody who's undergoing psychedelic therapy for the first time. You mentioned phenethylamines. Um, just so I can backtrack again for my viewers to understand again what it is, uh, what's the importance of the research pertaining to this and why it's important for them to, uh, I guess, pay close attention when it comes to uh, this particular procedure? <clears throat> yeah, so I can go for that one again, Dustin. Go ahead, Rochelle, yeah. Okay, yeah, so phenethylamines are a specific type of psychedelic molecule. So within psychedelics, there's actually a few different varieties. Probably the archetypical phenethylamine um, that people would think of is mescaline, and mescaline is what is right. derived from the peyote cactus or San Pedro cactus, for example. And mescaline is quite an interesting psychedelic. It has quite a few interesting properties. But from mescaline, a number of other phenethylamine psychedelics have been derived. So Shulgin's work, for example, he has an entire book on phenethylamines that were derived from mescaline, um, you know, that have kind of interesting properties and distinctions. And again, some of those molecules are more selective or more potent or have rapid onsets or longer duration times. And so that's some of the information that we took into account in considering how we wanted to design our phenethylamines. And, you know, again, there's other tryptamines, for example. So um, psilocybin, yeah. for example, is a tryptamine psychedelic. So they're related and they have common targets, but there are some differences as well. So circling back then, Dustin, to the uh, clinical pipeline, I guess, is the goal eventually to advance through the long phase trial process and bring these drugs to market? Yeah, so there's multiple answers to this. The, yeah. the initial answer is yes, absolutely want to get this into humans and we'll do the tr traditional FDA kind of filing and move forward. In fact, we've already started to set up some of our initial IND type meetings for that. Okay. But also last week, there was a big uh, piece of legislation that came through that was bipartisan with the right to try. And so we do see a lot of these compounds kind of maybe skipping some of those later steps with the ability for right to try type acts and getting these into people. 
We know these compounds. As scientists, we know these compounds are largely safe. But there's been all kinds of you know talk around oxytocin and other compounds that we know are super dangerous. These compounds are safe. They've been safe for millennia. So we're really excited. Is that important? To see this That's so important for people to understand. It's just like if you tell somebody that a shirt is black over a certain period of time, they start to believe you when really it's white. And that's kind of the perception that we've had. It really is. And, you know, here in the US, the DA scheduling, we love the DA. We have a DA license. It's amazing. <laughs> but if you look at the, the, harm, the harm ability of drugs, you have drugs like psychedelics that are the highest class of like, uh, highest classification, the most unlikely to study and get a hold of. And then you have drugs uh, like alcohol and tobacco that are super dangerous and harmful. The, uh, the ability for one to become addicted to those are super high, yet they're readily available. So really this stigma has been created by some of this scheduling that says these are drugs that are terrible. We spend a lot of time, we're uh, currently raising money, uh, looking for BC, and we spend a lot of time in meetings telling people psychedelics are not Think of psychedelics, not right? Harmful. And think about this so, like when I think about Alzheimer's and then what they're predicting in the next 20 to 30 years as the world is aging, and one of the key contributors towards it is smoking, and yet we're, we're, we're legalizing this. And in some, yeah. and I, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say a cure, but there's research pertaining to certain psychedelic compounds that could be showing advanced improvements for people related to this disease. And it's like, where are we at in society, right? When you, when you kind of put things into perspective and, you know, quite honestly, I, I, me personally, and I don't want to get into trouble for saying this, but I think it's just a generational thing. I think as we get older, we need change. And a lot of people that are still making the decisions, the rules, the laws, the government, uh, the corporations, are still run by older generations that grew up thinking like the Nixon administration that these compounds will make you insane, right? I don't know if you both feel that, but do you agree with that, uh, Dustin? Yeah, I definitely agree with most of the aspects of that. And again, another thing that we have to deal with uh, with the general public, I love your comment, this shirt is white versus black, is that you take psychedelics and you jump out of a window. That's the first thing that happens. Right. right? And you know, I think that the cannabis industry has done some things amazing and some things, you know, I've been a, a little more arduous, yeah. but one thing that the cannabis industry has done really well is that you don't pick up a joint and start rapidly playing the piano. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't yeah. exist that way. And similarly, I think uh, people are starting to look at psychedelics and talk to people that have done them and say, you know what, it was the most important thing that happened in my life. Yes. It changed who yes. I was. And I did it once and I'm done. I, I didn't do it, you know, every day for 20 years and then quit. There was no addictive capability to it. So yes, I think now maybe generationally, we're at least starting to say, this makes mm -hmm. sense. And from a pure scientific level, it doesn't make sense. We know from millennia of culture, you know, pre-colonialization of medicine, these were the medicines that people used. And so we're now going back and looking into this and seeing what the mechanisms are. And truthfully, as a scientist, it's been really, really hard to study these. Getting that DA license is almost impossible. Um, I'm not saying getting federal funding to, to study this is hard, but that's part of our right. impetus, is to create a company that might be an easier pathway to understand the mechanisms and beautiful therapies that are going to come out of these compounds that we're creating for everyone. Right, And I think that's a new path uh, that really hasn't been seen in 40 years. Rochelle, I assume that you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the data is really not in support of, you know, these substances being um, carrying what we would call abuse liability. Um, as Dustin said, people have tend to have a profound experience and think that they don't need to do it for a period of time. You know, it's, it's really not that um, type of experience where a person wakes up the next day and thinks, yeah, I should do that again straight away. Right. Um, you know, because sometimes it is involved or intense, emotional. Um, but I mean, again, these are the qualities that that lend it very well, lend these substances very well to, you know, really helping people work through their mental health issues. As yeah. Well. So. Yeah. 
Uh, last thing I wanted to bring up, one thing it is important when I communicate to my audience for companies that are in this space that are focusing on drug development is that it's very expensive and you need at least a nine digit cash war chest to see all the necessary trials go through. So Dustin, how do you best answer that question when referring to your own company? So I think we have a super unique advantage in that we've been in pharma for decades. Okay. And so most drugs, most drugs fail. Uh, and they fail for a couple different reasons. The major reason they fail, we've already talked about, is they affect the heart or some off-target effect. Um, so one of the things I think that Tesla has done really well, uh, some of our legacy research that we've been able to bring out of the university, is a way to screen these drugs in a whole animal to see that they mm -hmm. work. And so I think by just not kind of betting on a molecule and kind of, you know, standing on the shoulders of what's been done before, but reaching out and saying, does it work or does it not work? And does it work and does it not work for Tesla? It means two things. Is it psychedelic? And then does it have a therapeutic advantage? And so I, I think, honestly, <laughs> having lead compounds that are truly lead compounds that you know are therapeutic is a great mm -hmm. place to start to cut that huge, you know, one billion budget where you chase down a hundred compounds that aren't even right. psychedelic, for instance. Interesting. So I guess the big takeaway then, and Rochelle, maybe what's the questions? I guess when you look at certain companies are focusing on what when entering this space, based off of your story, what would you say are key questions that you always should be looking for when you're looking at companies within this space and obviously how you fit into that narrative? Yeah, so I think a good question in this space right now are, are people just reinventing the same thing over and over? So there seem to be a few companies that are really pursuing um, quite similar classes of, of compounds or, you know, sort of a new method of synthesizing the same thing. And I think that that space is getting a little bit crowded. Um, and mm. so, you know, are they actually pursuing something that's novel or are they p pursuing something that's already being pursued in a, in a different space? And then also, how are they preclinically validating? As Dustin said, we move as quickly as possible from you know our times partner partnering with industry um, as quickly as possible into whole animal models, so so that we can get a deep understanding. You know, some some companies are taking a, an approach you know where they're synthesizing huge numbers of molecules and then they screen them in a dish, which has some certain advantages uh, for sure. But you know, we're actually looking at maybe a smaller grouping of molecules, um, but testing them more thoroughly. And again, a lot of what we know about the, the massive costs that, that get racked up in pharma is that, you know, we have all of these um, molecules that we push up and up and up the pipeline, um, but eventually they fail. And so they've taken investment all that way along. And it's really these failures that, that contribute to that kind of growing price tag over time. So, you know, uh, we have this philosophy of, of trying to see if a compound can fail fast. We'd rather it fail fast in a whole animal model and understand whether it's, you know, worth pushing forward or not. Um, hmm. One of the problems and unfortunate problems we have is the poverty of riches in our 100 series library, uh, 12 out of 16, and maybe even the other two also, so maybe all 16 wow. are psychedelic. So, it, it can go both ways, but I, I think the shotgun strategy isn't effective anymore and the mass produced strategy isn't effective anymore because the brain is complicated. It is super complicated and it always finds a way to adapt and change to do things that yeah. people don't understand. And again, it goes back to that partnership with academia and industry. By having that basic knowledge, that basic science to interpret and help guide the business, I think you need to look further Is along. the idea to eventually go public? So we see that uh, going public is probably a necessity. It's not in the near su uh, future. We Which can is see probably a good thing. <laughs> right. Before, yeah. um, we can see a major liquidity event in the future where we need to bring all the money in to kind of get it into every human right. on the planet. And we mean that. Um, and so at that point, we see a big liquidity event, but not in the... We saw future. a peak in this industry from an investment standpoint around two years ago last fall. Do you think you'll see that again with this industry, Dustin? I'm a shameless optimist, so yes, uh, I think I think it's sticking this time, uh, and it's not the industry to me; it's the molecules and it's the yeah. I know, I know, right now. I know. It's that fun. <laughs> so I, I think it'll come around again. It seems to come around, like you said, every 30 or 40 years, and I think we're ready now. People are educated enough on their own 
to see what's happening. That I yeah, there's definitely I think a lot more advancement of understanding uh, what company actually has something and other companies that don't. You can't really raise two, three million bucks and get into drug development with one trial and one compound. And I think people understand that a lot more. But anyway, listen, I pre appreciate both of you taking the time to obviously check in with us here today. I applaud, obviously, everything that you're doing and uh, wish you all the best, obviously, moving forward and ask you to please keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you for your You're time. You're welcome. Your Let's speak soon. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you want to learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.